Okay. Where um, my presentation is uh, we have with this pandemic uh, times, we kind of had to stop with the main work we were doing. So it's, I can present what I, what I really wanted to present uh, at the conference. But I'm going to show you a few experiences and what the situation here in Argentina. Um, what are we pointing to uh, in the future after we finish to do what we want to do? We're going to see about uh, what's the situation here, uh, the conditions of the installations we have here, some examples, a few, two examples of uh, failures and why and how did we solve them. Uh, what are we trying to finish to what is our horizon? And uh, something that we've been talking about uh, in the education session, uh, that we were planning uh, since a few months uh, to do with the maintenance. So uh, it would be good to maybe after the, my presentation to chat a bit, uh, to speak a bit uh, about uh, this idea that I think it's, it can be very good for Ines the, the maintenance on the, on the turbines. So I think most of you know uh, how 500 RPM work. We have over 60 installations all over the country and Argentina and uh, in Uruguay, Chile, Brazil, uh, and now Mexico and Dominican Republic. Uh, each installation has a uh, different weather and different places. And we have put the turbines in places that are the most extreme, <laughs> maybe in, in these uh, latitudes because we have a uh, turbine installed as low as the Patagonia of Santa Cruz uh, with temperatures about uh, below 20 or 30 degrees uh, Celsius uh, under zero. And in places like uh, Salta here is the most, uh, is one of the places of the world we have that have a most uh, rad solar radiation in the world. So. Uh, these turbines are uh, subject to uh, very high temperatures and solar radiation that uh, rust all the structure and the blades and everything. Uh, we have a lot of turbines in places that, that are more like uh, the rest of the world with average winds of five, six meters per second. But here we have over 12 in some places. So the turbines like are all the time protecting them themselves and we have to make a few modifications. Uh, in Re Dominican Republic, there is a hurricane path <laughs> at that place and we put the turbine there. So it's been working for a year. It, it survived uh, like two hurricanes uh, and it's working. And that's thanks to the maintenance uh, lessons, the courses we made when we started. So we are gaining a lot of experience about what happens with the turbines when, when they are in, in very strong conditions and different kind of weather. We are working uh, at uh, making a rely on all the turbines, all the installations, contact all the people we, we installed the turbine and see how are they working, how, which, which problems we, did they have and how can, after that, we make a, a full briefing about what happened with the turbines, if they are all working, if they not, um, we lost contact with most of the installation sites. So we are trying to make this rely contacting all of them. I was telling Katerina early that there is 
uh, it's very difficult to get to the people because the installations are in remote places. Uh, and most of the times, people who made the maintenance course, they moved away from the place and another pe person took it. So it's very difficult to track that people, that new people. And sometimes they, they, it simply wasn't someone who made the maintenance. So that's the idea to get all the information we can, we can, and and make the statistics about what happened to uh, contact again these people and see how we can enhance our techniques of maintenance. Uh, for example, the conditions. This turbine is, uh, you saw this picture, but you didn't saw this one. Um, this is summer, the temperatures where this turbine is uh, assembly is uh, like in summer, there is like 10 or 15 degrees, but in winter we have snow. This turbine frozen like the most of the night and with the during day it uh, differs, it, it melts and starts spinning. So it works only a day. The average speed of this place is over 10 meters per second. Uh, there is no days without wind, so the turbine is almost all the time uh, entering, in falling, and going out, and all the time to the maximum capacity. Uh, I have some pictures of what happened to this turbine <laughs> after a few years of working. But the conditions for these turbines uh, are very strong. It's a very cold place and very windy and very aggressive. The, the earth, the land there is very salt, it has a lot of salt. So we have to treat very good the materials because they rust very quick. And there have been installations of turbines in this place, not pigots, but commercial ones. And they used to, to stick uh, the wires in the dirt with with wood, uh, very big piece, pieces of wood, like buried in the dirt, and the salt melted the wires and the towers fell down. So there are a lot of uh, issues we have to take account to ensure that the tower is going to keep uh, standing and the turbine is going to keep working. This in particular is for a telecommunication station. And there are a lot of these installations uh, in the south of Argentina. So it's very important to, to monitor the working of the turbines because they have telemetry, they have these cameras that we have. We are seeing all the, the working and the problems these turbines have. And there is a very good source of information about what happens with the turbine on extremely, extremely cold weather and extremely strong weather. So this is one of the experience. On the other side, we have in the midi in the medium we have this turbine. For example, is in Buenos Aires. It's like a very the very fire weather. It's very nice weather. We have a uh, like five four point five uh, meter per second wind. There are not uh, a lot of 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 storms and rains. And uh, we are using it to research, to gather data. We have a data logger installed and we use it to test propellers. This here is a fiberglass propeller that's working very good. And we are using this turbine to measure, to make measurements to water pumping. Uh, it's going to be our test bench for the final water pumping system that uh, in which uh, Guillermo Catuogno is working to make the controller. So it's like a test bench and we are gathering information about the work of the turbine in this kind of weather. So this turbine didn't have almost problem because it's a friendly weather. And this is a turbine that is installed on Republican Dominican Republic. Uh, the average winds are five or six meters per second, but they are in a hurricane path. So uh, we encourage all the people you see in the picture to make maintenance. We made a, an intensive 
like maintaining scores. And I think during December or January, they are going to make the first annual maintenance run, the uh, only preventive, but it's working very good. And uh, we asked them to get all the information they can about what was the state of the turbine at the time they they take them down, they take it down. So we can see what effect uh, made the the salt uh, is an island, so the salt and the, that kind of water having the turbine. So this turbine is the one you saw first, the one in the south uh, for the telecommunications. The wind was so strong that uh, the oscillation of the of the rotors and the the, the strength of the vibrations ended up like cracking the eight millimeters uh, thick uh, walls of the structure. This is an air local turbine. Uh, it's the commercial pivot, but uh, well, we have to, to reinforce it and make this shop you see here so the turbine can manage the, the winds of the place. There is also a problem with the fiberglass blade uh, in such extreme cold, we are seeing that they they prematurely fail. They broke. I think that uh, it's the resin we are using. So we have to take more information from people using these turbines to see how the other property works and maybe see a uh, see further to see what kind of resin can we use that lasts uh, longer. So uh, they make uh, a very, uh, like, I don't know the word, but they do the maintenance run uh, almost like six months and checking all the time how the turbine working, but it suffers a lot. So this is a very nice source for information about uh, extreme conditions of the turbines. Uh, this is another turbine. Uh, this was one of the first built by 500 RPM. Uh, it's, in, uh, it's in Buenos Aires. It's in the north of the province. Um, it's, it's been working like seven years without maintenance. So I made a, like a very deep uh, study on the turbine, on the problems it had. Uh, I could say but that uh, if this turbine had uh, a better have a better bearings, it could be still working without <laughs> maintenance because um, the problem was that the axle got uh, uh, thinner so we took uh, the play all the the rotor and destroyed the stator and the magnets i managed to rebuild the coils that could and make put all again in the mold. So I rebuilt all the structure. We, I changed the, the axle and got it working again. Uh, and now we made a uh, very deep capacitation on the owner of the turbine. So they do the maintenance once a year. And we are we installed a fiberglass plopper so we can check uh, how it works here uh, and what problems appear after a year and we are uh, in close contact with these people. So we are hoping to get uh, information about what's happening on it. So these are examples of the all the extreme conditions we have and the not so extreme, but uh, what problems could appear. And this is the way we are trying to gather information to make a like a statistic, a statistic uh, manual and how to attack the, the, the deteriorating of the turbines. In hot weather, we found that, uh, in cold weather, I'm sorry, uh, we found that the white colors uh, like make easy to the turbine to frozen. So we are painting the turbines black in very cold uh, weather 
so they heat faster with the sun and they start spinning uh, earlier and it works very fine very good on the other side in the hot weather we are painting the blades on white or clear colors because they started when they were painted on dark colors they changed the shape of the wheel of the blade uh, due to high temperature so uh, we started to paint all the turbine like clear colors for hot and dark color for for cold so we can minimize the the effects of this uh, stuff uh, it works uh, very fine uh, the white painted uh, propellers uh, they, they are lasting more time than the other ones so they are small stuff that can prevent damage and and in ace, the work of the turbine. So uh, this, uh, these are also examples. This turbine here had a problem that the turbine was perfect, but the batteries uh, dried, so it ran away, and we had to search for the magnets of the rotor in a 100 meter wide area in the last year. So this is the, the main issues we have been seeing these years. Um, I think the, the main work I have to do is to gather more information and to contact all the, the, the installation sites because these are few ones that we have contact, but there are lots uh, on, we don't have that contact. So we have to see what happened, what are the worst problems in, in the turbines. Uh, what we wanted to do before uh, the pandemic was uh, we started to doing to make contact with all the people but most of our installations are in schools and the schools are closed since february so we can't find anyone so it's a work we are gonna do next year to contact all the people who's working with the turbine we installed uh, talk to them, uh, ask for, pro for problems, and see if they are working, if they don't, what file it, if, if something filed. So make this a statistic and make like plans and small manuals to, to spread in the communities that have the turbines installed so they can keep in contact with us and see the manual and see how to how to repair the turbines easier or better. So we, we after that, we can, we'll see if this worked and how much it, it uh, had to see with the people who study turbines. And uh, what we are speaking was that had to see what we talk in the education uh, session it's how electronics call in haze maintenance. In order to that, uh, we are installing the data loggers in several turbines here. Uh, by now we have three, I think, uh, that have telemetry and we want to have all the information we can. We want to install more data loggers that will be like a first stage on this to gather hard information about all the the, the problems or the information about the turbines and may work on uh, alert systems to to find like Luis we were talking about uh, measure the tension the, the, the balance of the alternator to see if the propeller was uh, on balance so this kind of stuff is very important uh, it's important to gather information from the turbines with the data loggers and after we have a we got a lot of information we can uh, make like some small simple arduino based boards that see that information uh, it compares to the information it has it can read from the turbine and maybe show an alert show uh, an alert about the propeller unbalanced or not enough uh, changes of the current of the turbine uh, that's going below the the one it should be and stuff like that what can be filing and show maybe a picture uh, or a picture uh, a light in the board so 
people using the tool bank can see this alert and make the maintenance before it's uh, and it's too too grave. You, you can see it. So we can repair the turbine before the, for example, the the alternator grow broken and and then it's the work of the turbine. So that's about what we are trying to do. Um, well, who can we use? Um, the information gathered by the measurement group and try to enhance the maintenance of the turbines. So that's the, the presentation for today. Uh, I would like to hear about uh, if someone someone else uh, been working of, uh, on this and well, how, how can we enhance the working of the turbines? I think, Damien, there are a couple of um, questions. Ah, okay. I uh, want to, to answer them now and then start the discussion. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, let me see the questions. So there are two questions uh, from Emmanuel and one from Bram. First yeah. one. Um, do you have experience with fatigue load analysis for uh, you pick out, uh, turbines? I think it's a question to everyone, but uh, if you have any experience, Damien. Uh, sorry, I, I didn't uh, understand exactly. Yeah, fatigue uh, is... Um... Ah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Do you know the fiber lasso? Uh, ah, over wood. Uh, Bram, yes. Uh, in the south, uh, Cruzada Patagonica guys, uh, Nahuel and Sina and the people there, they are uh, just building a 2.5 meters turbine, uh, making with that uh, fiberglass over wood. Uh, they are still building. We we don't know how. It's gonna work. We took the model from another turbine, uh, and it should uh, work very good. Um, they should work fine. I think it's one of the best combinations, and they have they work very good because they are light, and they you can use a light wood, a very thick density, a thin density wood. So the structure, the main structure will be the fiberglass. Um, I am about to make a propeller on fiberglass and polyurethane uh, form. So it's almost the same, but it's, it's kind of the same system that uses Nick in Peru. Uh, but the wood and fiberglass, is it, it has to be one of the strongest ones. So, it's, uh, it will be interesting to see this big turbine, like four four point two meter wide uh, diameter, uh, work. So they they work fine. The the main issue I saw it on airplane blades uh, propellers. The main issue is to make a good uh, stick between the fiberglass and the wood because if don't, it uh, start to crack when it bends. So. Uh, you have to ensure that the, the contact with the, the fiberglass and the wood is, is very strong. And the other question is, was, uh, it was Emmanuel. No, uh, about uh, the open source the version, we are using a commercial one uh, and we are, uh, we have a, one commercial one uh, here in Buenos Aires, they are uh, another commercial in the south, and uh, the one that was open source was the, the one that Guillermo Catuogno has installed in Santo Luis in Argentina, uh, and that is uh, using a PLC, and he presented it in the in the education session, so you can check what he do. She he described all the system. It's very simple and I think anyone can do it.
So if, if you want any of you, you can contact me and we can take, we are experiencing with the fiberglass now. Um, well, about the data logging, we are starting, we have some installation, we want to make more of them, a lot of more. So mainly we are hoping that uh, we can get uh, an open source uh, data logging system with wind empowerment. And after we have one, uh, take it to install and make it work. Exactly, that one, Adrian. So any more questions? There was another one from Emmanuel about uh, the Eolocal uh, turbine. Have you answered that one? Uh, no, I didn't saw that. Let me see. Ah, okay, here. We don't have analysis for fatigue load uh, on these turbines. Uh, I didn't saw it uh, personally, but Nahuel Ancina was the one who made it. Uh, it was uh, still like uh, the, the standard still we use. Uh, I think it's 1045 uh, still. It was, uh, that was a laser cut, but uh, we often use the UPN, we, U profiles. Uh, this AO local is different. It's a, a, it's a sheet of metal like curved and a, a stronger, thicker than the one we use in the standard pivot. I've seen a lot of damage uh, on on structures, but they are all almost uh, more of the, most of them. They are like in the end of the welding. the The metal can get a, a bit less uh, strength, so they usually broke there. Okay, so it will be nice to have a, a a deep analysis on the turbines, on the on the on the materials. But I I am still learning to to load them to get them in the in the computer. I'm still learning to to that. So I hope uh, in the future I can get enough experience on that to to make the analysis the software analysis. So, any more? Okay, I think I uh, should pass to the discussion. Uh, you have my contact, so I think uh, who I do the blade maintenance. Um, if the, the blade is uh, wooden, I usually make one or two uh, repaintings of the blade. Uh, normally, like preventive maintenance, we, we put a varnish or new paint coat, uh, coat. So we ensure that the wood is not in contact with the air. And doing that, we have properties that Worked for over 10 years. Uh, the one I replaced, this one, this, you uh, know, this turbine, the prop, the wooden propeller uh, had uh, like one maintenance uh, downside to to fix the propeller. The propeller already was very, very like wasted. 
So the we have to make a new wooden blade uh, or replace it for a fiberglass. We choose the fiberglass and we will see how it works. Uh, in fiberglass blades, I don't repair them. The ones they broken, we don't use it anymore. And uh, in the wooden, we can repair it a few times. It depends of the strength of uh, of the wood we got for that building and uh, the conditions of the weather. But all that, I do some of them. Most of them do the people who who operate the turbine. Emmanuel, you are speaking about uh, wood or fiberglass? Ah, okay. In wood, it's more easy. It can be repaired. Uh, I don't repair if they are cracked, but I repair the when they are like uh, sandpiper. <laughs> I sometimes if uh, if it's very damaged, I sand it again and paint again. And if it is okay, I just put like uh, paint and polish and and paint again, and it, it works again. I think uh, properly in a friendly weather, it can last over 10 years with no problem. In fact, this one I replaced, I think it could be rebuilt, uh, repaired one more time and work for a few years more. Yes, the idea, the Adrian, the, my idea is once I have the, the statistics, all the information, uh, add them to like an appendix on the manual. So we can like uh, complement the, the manual. The idea is to gather all the information. I take pictures of all my reparations and try to gather all the information I can so I can get a lot of material about the, the filers and how to repair and what caused the, the filers. I am on, more focused on see what causes the fail to, to make preventive maintenance that uh, how to correct the damage that uh, it's already made. Uh, as we are in a Zoom meeting, I think uh, we can all like unmic if we want to ask some questions. So it could be a bit interactive <laughs> and better for Damian also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh... Hi, I don't know the world record uh, on a pico turbine, <laughs> but uh, I the I think the oldest the oldest I saw was this one that has over about ten years working and still can work. I think for the the world, yeah, if if it's correctly maintained and and work, it can be a problem. Yeah, we have a question Jonathan. from Jonathan. Yeah, I saw it. Um, I had some problems. You can see in this, uh, I want to put it full screen. Um, this turbine, the magnets were very rust because they got exposed because of the contact with the stator. So I kind of passed a very thin sand, sandpaper and a cover again with a resin uh, and they work uh, exactly how, the way it worked before. Uh, in some disc, in some rotors, I saw that the magnets uh, got thicker and expanded and broken the fiberglass. Uh, in, this, in that case, I usually replace them. 
the problem is that if the magnets are old, uh, they they can have different uh, magnetic rates, so it's very difficult. Once uh, some magnets start to break, start to to deteriorate, uh, I think it's better to change all the magnets, uh, all the in all the rotor. Can you hear me? So I might yes, ask sir. a question just uh, um, because um, I'm asking, I because I had some issue with a turbine that uh, is quite common, I think as well, where we had some uh, of the magnet of the steel discs uh, rusting. And so the rust sneaks underneath the resin and uh, kind of pushes away the resin from the steel disc uh, and the magnets. So it's uh, the issue was basically the steel disc starting to rust and somehow water makes its way into or behind the casting on the steel disc behind the resin. And uh, once that happens, uh, it's basically a full repair for, for the whole, uh, you basically have to replace the magnet disc and uh, put magnets on again and everything. And uh, I wonder if anybody else had experience on such failures and what they did about that, because I started only using galvanized steel discs from, from this projects and uh, Maybe someone else has experienced something similar. Just asking. Uh, Jonathan, I had uh, this turbine exactly you seeing. Uh, it had that problem. The rust was going inside the the for under the resin and to the magnets. Uh, in this case, I painted uh, all the disc. What I saw is in a lot of turbines that when you don't paint the whole disc the humidity goes through the disc below the, the resin and rust the magnets. So it's very important to paint all the disc to don't let enter the like the humidity before below the resin. And for the EO local, for example, we galvanize the disc, the complete disc. So it works very much better. Okay, thank you. No, you're welcome. Um, uh, Bram, uh, uh, Luis, that about the bearings. I have problems of bearings, uh, like wasting very early. Uh, we stopped. We stopped having that problem when we started to use the hubs with uh, cylindric uh, bearings, not uh, spheric, uh, spheric uh, bearings. The ball bearing, they uh, rust very, very quick, but the cylindric uh, bearings, they are, they work uh, for many years without problem. Uh, just, just to make a comment on that, is that uh, we have this wind turbine up in the hill and yeah. uh, we were, I don't remember, it was Gilou who calculated how many, we tried to calculate how many thousands of kilometers it does a year because of the of production, and it was something like hundreds of thousands of kilometers a year. The the, the wind turbine is spinning all the time uh, yes. because this this region is very windy uh, in 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 Europe in in France in Europe. Um, so we do have. Uh, uh, conic wearing, uh, bearings and they wear very fast uh, in our case. We replaced it after two, after two years uh, because there was some issues with, uh, we, we took too long to replace the first time and then the second time we replaced after two years. But it, uh, yeah, I just wanted to see if there was an issue with somebody else as well. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, but uh, what size is the turbine, Luis? It's a, a 1.8. Uh, yes. It has a Polo um, uh, hub on it, I think, mounted on it. Ah, okay. Um, look, uh, no, we in the south, we have installa installed turbines like four or five years working with over 10 meters per second wind. Um, they don't uh, became, we, we didn't have the problem with the, with the bearings. Uh, Check the balance of the blade. Uh, it's perfectly balanced. Mm, that's no. I mean, we balanced it last time, uh, but no. The 
The wind turbine is not perfectly balanced. One of the blades is a little bit lighter than the others. We balanced it. It was balanced the first time and we rebalanced it, but uh, it does have a, an issue with the rotor. That's that's true. They, there is a problem uh, I saw that is a shape, the dynamic unbalance, it's not only the, the, the static balance. When the blade uh, has different weight between blades, uh, you can balance we by adding weight or uh, weights or co we do often no but if one blade is not exactly the same shape that the other one the when the turbine starts to accelerate uh, it it starts to speed to vibrating and that's dynamic uh, unbalance and that causes uh, premature damage to bearings maybe you have that problem uh, you have to check you can make like a tiny profile to compare the shape of all the blades and see if they are all equal. I'll, I'll work on that. I'll, I'll 3D print something and I'll, when we do the next maintenance run, we'll probably maintenance run it again uh, this year uh, in 2021. So I'll, I'll take a look, I'll let you know. You can check that. Uh, I had that problem in a fiberglass blade that was uh, mounted incorrectly. So one of the blades was, uh, was off the axle <laughs> of the, the position. So it, it induced, it was very static. It was, the shape was exactly the same. The weight was exactly the same, but uh, by the change of position of this blade, it induced uh, vibrations and they not only broke the, the bearings, it also made it was in a windmill tower and it was like a circus, the, the noise. <laughs> it, was, it made all the structure shape, shake. I had also something to add to the, to the bearings uh, thing. And mm -hmm. uh, for example, I, what I experienced is, is that uh, bearings can fail uh, also because of the humidity or uh, if water leaks inside the bearing somehow. And that can really be uh, just slightly different uh, frame design or steel structure used for the turbine that leads some water to somehow sneak into the backside of the bearing, basically. And uh, if you use some car bearings, they do have this kind of rubber seal on the back that should keep water out. And uh, a lot of people, including myself, sometimes take uh, the spring out of the seal so it has less pressure on the axle and uh, doesn't add as much friction. And uh, that way it spins easier, but also water can sneak into the bearing from the back a little easier. And uh, what I do now is uh, try to cover up the backside of the bearing somehow. So water, at least rain water, can drip down from some steel frame parts uh, onto that backside of the bearing and stops it uh, from getting in there. And actually it made a big difference. I had new bearings in a, in a machine and only for one year. Uh, and there was water somehow finding its way to the back of the bearing, back of the hub. And uh, the new bearings were completely done after a year. Uh, and on other sides, they last for like five, six, six, seven years with no problems. So it must have to do something with slight uh, differences and uh, changes in the design or uh, inconvenient uh, things that le lead to water coming to the back of the hub. Just saying. Yeah, there is an issue that, I'm sorry, uh, there is an issue what, that I've been facing that is uh, some of the hubs I'm using, they have like that problem you say that it's very like it costs to spin because of the seals. And the main problem of that is that uh, it's not easy to balance the, the blades on these uh, like uh, strong uh, hubs. So maybe we I can balance well the propeller on that uh, hubs. So the problem is that if I take away the seals, the hub can fail because of the water entrance. And if I leave the seals, the, the bearings can fail because I took away the, seal, the seals and the humidity is, is, is entering. So this, it's a problem. I, have, I started to select very well the hub I use uh, to, to check that the, the seals doesn't break the, the spinning of the hub. 
to, so I don't have that problem. Um, another comment I was making on the on the chat is that uh, we could maybe work on the idea of uh, putting a sensor on the tower, like yeah. a, a piezoelectric, you know, something that gives you the vibration of the tower and, work and study if the vibration, that the, how does the vibration can help us, you know, kind of predict those the, the, these issues. Uh, this could be an, uh, like a work for the next two years because it's gonna take a long time to develop that, but still it could be an interesting thing between the measurement and the maintenance working group. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a very good idea. Uh, put uh, some like accelerometer on the top of the tower or, or in the turbine to check the vibrations. Even in the, in the wires, in the ropes, uh, that sustain the tower, they, they, you can feel the vibrations there. I have so, a question for uh, Jonathan. Um, Jonathan, I, uh, I thought it was you that uh, was mentioning uh, 3D printing for uh, the stator. Um, I have been uh, using, I have been doing uh, experiments on that myself. So 3D printing and a PET, uh, the, the plastic that's also uh, used for uh, regular plastic bottle. Um, for now, it has been promising. Um, I have put uh, stators um, and a bucket of water for weeks and um, the neodyme magnets came out fine. Um, but if you're interested, uh, certainly reach out. And uh, there's some uh, information on our website also. Maybe it's something uh, new to look at if it's uh, hard to do with epoxy to uh, make them uh, humid free. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, I think it was me raising that issue with the magnet corrosion. Yeah, yes. and uh, I, I heard about stuff like that, having a 3D printed case for the magnets somehow uh, instead of using resin. I don't actually know, and I've never done it myself, but it sounds interesting. Um, another thing that uh, I was just going to say is that the type of resin is also quite important for that uh, as it, uh, some resin seems to stick uh, better to the steel disc than others. And I don't exactly know what kind of resin is the best, uh, but I have experienced that some resin uh, almost uh, doesn't stick to the steel discs. And some of the resins that you can get really glue to the disc, so it's hard to get it off again. And uh, yeah, there is worth to do some investigation on, on that as well. Mm -hmm. Maybe also the humidity in which you are working or the humidity in which uh, you are uh, casting the uh, resin maybe also plays a role, I don't know. Or maybe you can try as well grinding a lot the steel disc prior to cast the resin so that you have uh, uh, biggest uh, adherence between the, the resin layer and, and, uh, and the steel plate. Yeah, that's what I do anyway. I, I always uh, try to make it rough before casting but if you have galvanized disc, you don't want to make it too rough. So you would uh, scrap off all the galvanization and uh, that would also be not, uh, not ideal. But uh, I guess there is also a difference between uh, if you use polyester resin, which is of course not watertight in most cases. So water can uh, soak into it. And if you use the vinyl ester resin, which is uh, watertight, but uh, it's, it's uh, the common thing, I guess. And then there you can use epoxy resin, which is more expensive, but it will uh, maybe not always stick as nicely to the steel discs as the vinyl ester resin. So it's, uh, I guess it's a compromise, but don't use polyester, I think. Would it make any sense to, to print a sort of a 3D sleeve that you kind of at the you know, by quarters that you connect, that you clip together on the on the disc, and then you bolt it. You know, the, something that would uh, you could then cast the resin on the on the sleeve, and the sleeve just comes in, and you just connects it to the clips it to the to the disc. Would that be something useful? So is that just uh, answer you by the chat? Uh, exactly that. Uh, they are magnets that come drilled, so you can bolt them to the to the rotor. And then I think it's very it's very possible to make a 3D print for for a line for protection.
Okay. It goes with it will be right. Uh, just a quick question. What type of resin are you guys using in Argentina? That would be for, for 500 RPM. So, yes, we use for... Uh, sorry? No, that's it. Go ahead. Ah, uh, we use uh, the resin, uh, epoxy resin, uh, two components, and it mixes like 7% and 30%. Uh, it's used for electronics and for casting, not for laminating. You saw that Maybe could you add some kind of data sheet or a source for that, so I could do some research on the product. That would be interesting for me to see some of the technical data sheets of the resin that people use, so I can compare stuff. Yeah, yeah I will send you. Uh, the the sheet. This uh, we use for a local manufacturer. So they have their like their own uh, catalog, but I will try to phone, find all the information I can, so I pass it to you. Uh, we had problems, for example, in the Dominican Republic. We used a uh, resin that was uh, kind of the one you, we use here, but in that conditions, it goes so much hot, so much heat that it uh, boiled uh, in, when when it was. Uh, Curating, they, they were it was like uh, hardening. So in the places that the resin wasn't uh, constrained to the mold, it went like a ball. We made a globe with the the rest of the resin that exceed uh, from the casting, and the, the hand became this size and melts the globe, the the silicone globe. So. Uh, it depends a lot of the weather of the place we are work working and the kind of resin. But yes, uh, I will pass you the information I have so you can check it there. Luis, uh, may I when Adrian came with the idea of the wiki, I thought automatically to make the in the wiki make the database of, of for maintenance. Yeah, super. Mm. Maybe we could uh, reference uh, types of resin too in this wiki and their advantages and disadvantages. Yes, I will take a picture. I have the the back of the. Of the catalog uh, we use uh, from our local manufacturer, and um, maybe on that you can get information. I will try to contact my provider and ask him uh, which kind of resin he used. It's a uh, epoxy for castings, but I don't know uh, the composition of it. Mm -hmm. There is a suggestion about uh, like uh, drilled magnets. Um, yeah. Maybe there's a, qu a question uh, for uh, for Costas uh, on how it could uh, affect the generator performance. Uh, so some small holes uh, for uh, for screwing them. Yeah. You have to you use a uh, bronze uh, like bronze. Uh, bolts, uh, no no ferromagnetic uh, bolts, uh, and the magnets uh, I saw in in eBay, I saw magnets that came already uh, drilled. But is anybody of you aware of ferret magnets uh, with holes from suppliers because I just saw it with neo, uh, neodymium magnets and I never saw yeah, a supplier who sells the ferret magnets because I guess it's also very difficult to to put the hole in there if you want to do it yourself. I would guess that you would have to order these magnets directly from a supplier and they would drill it probably for you. Although I think it is not recommended to have something going through the magnet as the thing would cause some magnetic short circuit from one side of the magnet to the other. 
at least if it's from steel or some uh, magnetic material. So it would have to, have to be from aluminum or something like that. But it adds a lot of complexity to the, to the thing in some way. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think I saw neodymium magnets with holes, but I'm still not convinced by that uh, idea. Yeah. So what, what people do is just using high, high quality glues to glue magnets onto the steel disc, which is actually stronger than, uh, is strong enough, let's say that way. So for example, the, the UK manufacturer Proven Wind Power, they use some uh, special glue for, for magnets to be just glued onto a steel disc and uh, it's actually really strong. So I don't know for ferrite, it's actually not such a big deal, the corrosion issue with the steel discs, it's more the neodymium machines that suffer from that. Does anybody yeah. of you have, have experience with uh, just glued magnets? We uh, wanted to put a turbine in the field, like maybe this year still, where we just glue the magnets on and don't put any resin in, would be also great for yeah, later recycling and yeah, easy to manufacture actually. I, I, we didn't, we always uh, make the casting for, for the magnets, never done it with, without it. We glue the magnets with a uh, cyanocrylate. So the thing is with gluing that uh, most of these uh, strong adhesives, uh, like the special glues, that uh, would last even if you don't put any casting around for, for ferrite uh, magnets. These glues uh, are quite hard to, to, to work with. So you have to put it on first and let it dry for, for a while. And then you have to put it on, on the disc and put it in place, but it's actually slipping away. So because it's gonna be pushed by the other magnets. So we tried that to do that. And it's actually not, uh, not easier than doing a casting, I think. For, for most situations, especially if you have some kind of cheek to glue them on with or something that makes it easier, I don't know. I think you can try like a low density cyanocrylate, the one used in model airplanes, uh, that it dries very fast you can apply a coat of it in the in the back of the magnet and put it on the disc. It uh, dries very fast. You don't have the problem of moving, and it can also make a, like a protection coat between the disc and the magnet. But I think it it will be the, after that you can paint the magnet on some a strong painting or coating of something. But I don't know the result uh, in the time. So I guess the, the casting around is just another safety measure as well. As most uh, times that for the ferrite turbines, you put some kind of rope or steel wire around the magnets uh, yeah. to keep the, keep them uh, protected from centrifugal forces before you do the casting so that they can fly off. So that measure, you won't have that if you just glue them on. And so it's kind of a safety thing as well to stop them from flying off the disc at some point because vibration can still undo some cyanacrylate uh, super glue stuff. If it vibrates heavily for a long time, some ferrite magnets have been fallen off the disc if there was no casting. So I know that from experience. Ah. But maybe the, the, for me, one of the biggest outcomes of what we've discussed so far in the maintenance working group is the importance of monitoring the vibration to be able to detect any, any failure before it happens. And, and so maybe the, the way to deal with these vibrations is, is trying to prevent them by monitoring them. What do you think? Yes, the main stuff is that when we do corrective maintenance, uh, once you can hear the noise or see the vibration, it's too late. You already have a, a very strong problem. 
uh, to solve. But if you can measure it on a sensor, like Luis says, said before, uh, or check the voltage, uh, the, the unbalancing on the stator, for example, uh, that way you can see the damage because before it's too late, before it's too big to, to repair. Before the, this, the, the particular damage can cause damage on another parts of the turbine. So shall we, uh, do we have a, a clear need here? Because maybe we can uh, think of a collaboration between maintenance and, and technology to say, okay, we have this need of monitoring the vibration before it happens, or to get a, a, an, an insight of what's happening in terms of vibration so that we can design maybe, I don't know, like a small um, IoT sensor we coupled with an accelerometer that is cheap and that co can communicate the data and I, I, I think it could be a, a good uh, way of, um, of uh, solving this issue by just uh, being able to say, okay, now uh, the vibrations are getting high, so let's, uh, let's stop the turbine and have a maintenance now. Exactly. That, that was the, the last I put in the presentation about uh, using Arduino was uh, exactly for that. Not uh, I just named Arduino because it's a chip board that has uh, the the enter that had that can manage some programming. That if the accelerometer feels that the vibration over some kind of a gap, uh, the that shows an alert. You can make a simple circuit that once we know how much is too much uh, vibrations we can like uh, light a, a small lamp in the, in the board, in the protection board, or in the house of the, of the place where you are feeding with electricity and see, okay, there is too much vibration, like the service light in the car. So you have to take down the turbine and check the problem, for example. I think uh, this is quite interesting. I, I've, uh, I'm just, Right now, I'm working on um, um, a very small drone, just for the fun of it, for some of my teachings, uh, where the drone is actually an Arduino that has a Bluetooth uh, yeah. on it uh, and attached together with uh, a uh, an Arduino. It's a very low-cost Arduino add-on board that gives you, which is an accelerometer. It has accelerometer and so on and so forth. So I could look into that with some students here at the university. If we can, if we can, kind of uh, carve out a very clear um, uh, specification that we need, I can uh, I can actually share this on the on the working group later on, and right. I think we can build it from there. And I do have uh, a few students who are going to work on this kind of stuff uh, in June. So we can work, I can work on it. I can talk to you guys. We can, you know, profile something more clearly and have that ready. So we can have some people working on it for two weeks and, and trying to make the first prototype. You know, it takes time to develop this kind of stuff. It's not going to be ready by, by in two weeks, but this is the kind of stuff we can kind of organize each other around. If we have a clear specification, people like me who have access to, to free intellectual slave labor, we can actually hire them and get them to work with us, you know what I mean? That's, that and and the thing is not necessarily to, to be set online. I mean, like the data logging is not crucial to, to get online. It can be just offline and having a, a small captive Wi-Fi network, for instance, or BLE, Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth network, where you have the breaker that has a, a dongle that permits to remotely actuate it and also just the sensor so that when the vibration level gets high, it breaks the, um, it breaks the, the, termi the turbine. So basically the, 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 the accelerometer would be next to the generator and would monitor the vibration level. And, and then just next to, to the breaker cabinet, we would have like another small uh, Wi-Fi or remote, um, remote um, microcontrollers that would be able to act on the break. That's right, yes. I think one of the main challenges is to identify when to stop the turbine. Like 
to identify the, the shape of the harmonics that, uh, the, of the vibrations in their frequencies that sig signifies uh, that any failure is happening uh, there and it's not uh, just normal uh, vibration. So I think uh, that needs a very long-term uh, analysis, but we should install uh, right now some, uh, some sensors to start uh, <laughs> identifying that. <laughs> So sorry, just the, the so, sorry to cut you, Jonathan. I just want to be sure that uh, we can keep on the discussion on on other channels, so we don't maybe don't monop monopolize all the, the the discussion on the specifics yeah, of this yeah. particular project. Uh, like I said, uh, I'm more than I'm working on something that could possibly be quickly tweaked. And since I have contacts in the region with people who have wind turbines, we're turning all the time. You know, can go there and take it to the wind turbine and get some data for, for two weeks and we can analyze it together, that kind of stuff. I can kind of work on that, uh, but I would really love to have a more, you know, that we come together with a more clear specification and talk about it, uh, what kind of uh, need we have and that kind of stuff. Yeah, and I just wanted to add that here in, in Vienna, I have one friend who's a student and he's exactly working on that kind of school. He wants to analyze the the waveform of the generator and uh, detect some failures in the stator alignment and bearing uh, before they actually cause some damage. And uh, he, he's trying to find some algorithm to do that. And uh, I, I guess he's really looking to find someone else to collaborate with because he's doing that alone. So if anybody wants to work on stuff like that, uh, I would love to forward this guy to you. Okay. Great. Super. Great. Yeah. Um, I think uh, we we have other uh, things to to talk about during this uh, two hour session before the board feedback in the election. Um, we have uh, hackathon uh, hackathon outputs and uh, conference feedback. So it's uh, I guess it's time to pass on that uh, to yeah to. Um, yeah, to be able to collect uh, your feedbacks and uh, and then uh, have some time for the association focus discussion. Um, Damien, do you have any anything to say to close the session? Or uh... I think we, it, it's okay. Uh, well, thank you everyone for listening and for participating. Uh, I think it's it's very productive to see that there's a lot of people working on this and we have to like uh, go together and start uh, giving shape to all of this. Okay, many thanks uh, Damian for uh, bringing uh, all these nice pictures and uh, analysis about maintenance. Um, just a heads up, I created a maintenance uh, page on the wiki. <laughs> yeah, I will check the link. I will try right, to yeah. yeah. Okay. By now, I, I'm very like a uh, messy, <laughs> no messy the football player, but messy the mess. Uh, all my documents are sparse, but I have to assemble something, uh, something good, and I will start to upload information that can be very useful. And maybe was as I told you before, try to make like a compliment for for the existing manual, so an appendix, uh, so we can uh, get it better. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, Damian, uh, are you host of the meeting? I think yes, yes. C can you make me co-host? Um, let me see. I gave the host uh, to somebody else because I had the internet problem. <laughs> then uh, I need it now to share my screen. and. You know, I don't, I can't do it. it does, okay, I don't so have the, should be the, the host. I made him host because he hosting the next session. But uh, um, maybe Costa. So, Gustas, are you here? Uh, yeah, Adrian. So, okay. what, what um, do you mean? could you right click on uh, on my name and uh, made me make me host? Because I made you host because you are hosting mm -hmm. the next session, but then I can't uh, share my screen anymore. <laughs> okay, how's that? 
thanks. Oh, okay. That looks uh, nicer now. <laughs> um, so what I propose now uh, to be right on time is to have five minutes of uh, of hackathon output uh, for the IET book and five minutes for the wiki. Uh, and then we will uh, go on uh, with the conference feedback uh, and we will discuss in small groups. Um, so Luis, you want to start uh, uh, with the IET bookathon? Sure. Uh, well, the feedback is quite faster than five minutes. Uh, nobody showed up. So it was uh, me and Jonathan for the first um, meeting, which was supposed to be on Tuesday, end of the day French time. And on Thursday, end of the day French time, there was no one. So I did have a few people who were very interested in the book, though, that, that, that signed up. Uh, on the Excel spreadsheet that it has the dashboard of the book. So if we talk about um, say objectives for the bookathon, which was to find authors and po potentially to write a few paragraphs on each one of the chapters. In terms of finding authors, some people came, uh, you know, uh, talked to me and said that they were interested and so on. So instantly uh, giving a little shout to uh, Nick Warren, he said he wanted to lead one of the chapters. So he signed up as a lead author uh, on the community part for the post project chapter. Um, but mostly, uh, you know, there was uh, Loic, he did give me a shout uh, as in he wanted to potentially coordinate one of the chapters and he's very interested in, in, in collaborating. So. And there was, you know, there were a lot of people. I mean, I, I can't be exhaustive, It'll take more for more than five minutes. There were, there were quite a few people who were interested. So what I ask everybody is on Discord, on the Bookathon, I actually pasted the link to the, um, the dashboard. So if you are interested in one of the chapters and your name is not already on it, because some other people are already on it, uh, please go there and subscribe. So we'll get back to you. And whoever wants to be a lead author, that means that once you take some time to coordinate other authors, to work on a specific topic, which is one single chapter, uh, don't hesitate to let me know. Uh, if you want to know more about what is a leading author, don't hesitate to contact me as well. I can give you uh, some more, you know, explain a little bit better what it is. Uh, I will send an email to everybody who is an author or lead author of the book uh, in the coming weeks. I'll try to set up a meeting about the book before Christmas. Uh, I'll work a little bit on the dashboard. So if you have the link on the dashboard, you, you may notice some changes. I'll try to list things a little bit better so we can actually see the progress of different subsections and sections within the dashboard, at least for what we already have as, as ideas. Um, and that's it. Like, don't don't hesitate to come come forward. I'll try to set up meeting by mid December so we can be a bunch of us around the table and and just sort of coordinate the the schedule of what we're gonna do. Uh, and let's get this book done next year. It's gonna be great if we can have an objective that by next Christmas we have our first our, our we book. That's gonna be amazing. Thank you. Thanks, Ruiz. Yeah, on my side, uh, it was uh, a bit the same. So um, a few people uh, showed up at the, at the meetings. So there was uh, three meetings planned. We had two, on one on Monday about brainstorming, one on Wednesday, but we were only two and it was, uh, uh, we were all very tired and busy. <laughs> I think the purpose of a hackathon was to like uh, fully dedicate um, to a project for uh, a certain amount of time uh, to make it uh, to make some advances. But I think uh, this conference was uh, rather an Ironman than a, a marathon uh, for uh, for some of us, and um, we overestimated the time and the energy that people could allow to the I think to the conference. So it was a bit uh, too much, I think, to plan some uh, hackathons, but uh, we can discuss about that in conference uh, feedback. Uh, but still, we have some uh, interesting uh, stuff about the wiki. Um, 
So that was the brainstorming we did uh, on the and it continued on the Monday. And uh, to sum up a little bit, uh, we have uh, only three like uh, free working group related uh, topics, but uh, actually there are some some more. It's just that it, it was not on the board, uh, on the posted board. So yeah, on the market assessment uh, side, uh, Alfie proposed a decision flow chart to explain um, uh, decision making about a wind, small wind turbine project for a sustainable uh, rural electrification. Um, education, there was an idea of uh, having uh, how to teach tips paragraph after each, like describe the word or um, uh, technical subject to like uh, to help uh, the um, trainers to, to train the students during the wind turbine workshops. Technology, it was about general function of some parts, rectifier, some etc. And uh, some manufacturing tips that could be put on the wiki. Um, generally, uh, we could put some, uh, that's only ideas and that could be discussed in further steps, but uh, generally it's only definitions, uh, descriptions, projects uh, that could be on this wiki. Could be also tutorials and how to do uh, like guides, but it's up to the author that has uh, like written all this content uh, to decide if they want to open source it on the wiki or to actually write an article on the wiki that is talking about his work and keep uh, a means to reward uh, his um, hard work by like uh, referencing a link uh, to his work and uh, maybe a, an ebook uh, reseller or whatever. Um, yeah, so that was uh, some ideas. I think we 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 come out with uh, more questions than uh, answers <laughs> on this wiki uh, topic. And uh, so yeah, I think the 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 main question is what would uh, would we like to share, and that should be the purpose of a of a single uh, single uh, gathering. <laughs> uh, is that all right to advertise some project on the, on the wiki? Uh, that's, a, that's a question we wonder with Jonathan together. And uh, we answer that uh, as long as this is not aggressive uh, advertising and uh, like, uh, and that also, that just uh, describes, um, that it, as long as it is descriptive and is, is not uh, a disadvantaging other members of projects, it's okay to refer to refer to uh, some projects. Um, so that's that's an idea of uh, answer, but uh, it still have to be uh, discussed. Should should the wiki talk about how to or just be an encyclopedia linking to sources of knowledge? Uh, I just uh, I've talked about that. It's up to you. It's up to the to the person that uh, wrote the manuals. Uh, to put it on the wiki or to put a reference to his work on the wiki. Uh, there was another question about the license. Um, so the wiki license uh, for the moment is a Creative Commons share like 4.0. Uh, so because uh, it was re recommended by Louis, means that uh, it has to be, it can be modified, shared, uh, but uh, it cannot. Uh, it it has to be shared with the same uh, license if it's modified. So it kind of pro protects uh, our work in uh, in that meaning. And I'm sure we will be of great help with uh, explaining this license in a further in a further meeting. Uh, how could this work be complementary with the book, uh, the IET book? Uh, I guess some information uh, that we find on the wiki could be found on the book too. So how do we manage with that? Uh, and then uh, shall we join an existing platform like an LGPDA? That's a good question. It's, uh, I think it's, it's great gathering information on one place and an LGPDA is a well-known uh, and well-respected uh, platform uh, that is uh, filled with uh, by many communities. Um, and there is uh, something on wind turbines. So, is it uh, interesting for us or is it a break? Uh, I don't know. 
uh, to actually be part of another uh, organization as a community. Maybe it would benefit to more people. Uh, that's another question to discuss. Um, so I'll let you with more uh, questions <laughs> than answers. Uh, some propositions for the next steps we could constitute a reflection task force. We have a mailing list and a Discord channel for that. All, all this information is on the web, website page, uh, Wiki Hackathon. Um, we could, uh, yeah, that could be a project uh, that could be led by the education working group. Uh, we could meet with an Edupedia to ask uh, for more information about how they, the community is functioning. We could propose to each uh, working group uh, to gather some material. And we could uh, collaborate with students uh, for them to, to fill the wiki instead of uh, writing reports that will be read by only one professor. <laughs> uh, I think that's all. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's all uh, about that. Um, maybe we could do a, a short, uh, a short discussion, uh, like a five minute discussion about uh, this, um, about the, the hackathons, or uh, we could, uh, no, let's, let's keep that for, uh, for the feedback in small groups. That would be better. Um, so now, I, now I propose uh, to create some uh, breakout rooms. Uh, so at the moment, right now we are at 19. Um, so that could be three or four rooms, maybe three rooms. Um, and uh, in each room, I will share again my screen. Uh, sorry. In uh, each room, um, the idea is to ask uh, a few questions, uh, to discuss these questions. So these questions are uh, suggestions. The idea is to um, uh, express uh, what you feel about the conference, uh, what you have uh, lived. So specifically uh, about the format, what did you think about the format, uh, the time management, the structure, was it too loaded, what is, uh, uh, yeah, et cetera. Uh, did you have enough time uh, to attend the conferences, uh, et cetera. Uh, was it to be, if it was to be done again, what would you remove or add to the conference? Um, so I invite you to write down the questions. Um, or I will, uh, no, okay, I, will, I know I will, I will, how I will do it. I will uh, put it on the, on the pad. And uh, do you think the conference goals are fulfilled? So I will show the, the goals and I will write them uh, on the top of the pad too. You will all have access to it. And the last question, would you like to get involved in a future uh, Win Apartment Conference organization? Um, so in each uh, small room, so we'll be, I think uh, if we do three rooms, we'll be six, uh, two rooms of six and room, one room of seven people. Uh, there will be a timekeeper. So we have, uh, from now we have uh, 20 minutes um, to, to discuss. There, there will be a facilitator. Uh, that helps people to talk and make links between points, and a secretary that keeps track of what is being said. So I will send you this link on the chat, um, and uh, there will. So this link is a, it's actually a pad, and uh, on this pad it's a collaborative uh, document where we could do three three parts, each part uh, corresponding to a room, a, break, a breakout room. So. Um, so you will be able to write under this and see uh, and see the question on the top of the document, and also see the conference objectives. Just a brief recall of the conference objectives: it was to reinforce the network and to transfer knowledge. So the idea is to uh, wonder uh, if uh, you have learned anything, uh, if it has uh, enabled uh, peer learning according to you if you have discovered a lot of things or uh, and news and about reinforcing the network do you feel more uh, like part of the network um, have you built uh, more uh, new connections have you participated to the collaborative tools uh, kickoff 
And uh, I think about the association focus discussion, this is the purpose of, uh, of today's uh, meeting. So enough talking for me. I think it's up to you to talk now. Uh, do you have any question about that? Or is it clear? <laughs> I hope it's clear. Okay, can I just repeat to be sure that I understand that now we're going to all break out in different rooms within each yeah. room we're going to do feedback on the conference. And yeah. uh, in each room there is one person keeping time and one person keeping notes or no. Yeah, exactly. So okay. the first and how long notes, is this? Uh, 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Uh, okay, so maybe for uh, everybody to uh, for for easier uh, feedback, maybe we could do four groups. Uh, for the one feedback. in each one, or like in the coffee room, chai, uh, no, and so on. We have breakout rooms. these rooms. I will do breakout rooms now in Zoom. Uh, so it will be easy for you to jump in rooms. Uh, it will be actually I will uh, randomize so everybody will be sent into a room. Uh, so for the secretaries. Uh, so it's a self-organization. So, um, so we, you will choose um, who is the secretary, who wants to be the secretary, who wants to facilitate, who wants to write down. Uh, and uh, at the end, we will uh, all secretary will talk one minute with uh, three or four main points that is uh, uh, that is uh, important uh, to to the group. Okay. So here is the, the pad. Adrienne, will you add the questions to the pad? Yeah, I will, uh, I will add them, yeah. Okay. Uh, so the question. So I added the questions. Uh, I recommend to enter your name in the top right. So we can see who is writing. And I will put the conference uh, objectives also. Uh, so should we divide this in uh, three parts per yeah. room? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we could do uh, room one. Yeah. OK. Um, so yeah, let's uh, randomize this. and. Uh, We'll see you in uh, 20 minutes. Uh, so let me try to do the breakout rooms. Uh, four rooms automatically.
So Costas, where have you been during the first weekend of the conference? I didn't see you in the in the list of participants of the, some sessions. In the first week? Uh, in the weekend, I mean. when uh, the f Have you been there actually? Yeah, yeah, I was there. Actually, I missed, uh, I missed uh, yesterday's sessions. All right. But I saw all, all, all the stuff that you guys presented for the, in the technology working group. I thought that was great. Yeah, did you hear the charge controller stuff that I was presenting? Yeah, yeah, I saw that. I was, uh, it was nice to figure out how the, this frequency uh, control works, the, the, the tristyle fo follower. Yeah, it was an interesting topic, but uh, it should have been uh, more time to talk yeah, about definitely. it. It is quite uh, complex if you, it's a simple circuit, but it makes a lot of complex mm -hmm. situations. No, the idea to have, uh, you know, these kind of online meetings uh, per working group throughout, spread throughout the year, I think that's uh, something to take forward. We should probably do it. And I think, okay, you know, like Adrian is really keen to... Hello, everyone again. Hello. What's up, guys? <laughs> Great. Hello, what's up? Hey. <laughs> Okay. I just realized how big my hair is looking today. That's huge. <laughs> <laughs> looking great. Mine is huge as well. You didn't, like you didn't condition it. Right. <laughs> it depends huh? on the distance of the camera. So you, you can get it bigger <laughs> and smaller. <laughs> right. <laughs> I said you didn't condition it, Alfie. Me too. <laughs> uh, actually, I want to. Hi, Mike, everyone. Hello. I hope this went well. Yes. <laughs> Shall we uh, wait? Uh, yeah. Okay. Is it? Uh, are all the secretary ready to to summarize uh, in one or two minutes? Uh, what has been said in their group, or do they need uh, two minutes to just uh, write a few bullet points? Uh... Uh, I can start. I can start. That will give plenty of minutes for the other secretaries to wrap up. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so now on this session, I'm the timekeeper, Luis. And, uh... oh, wonderful. So <laughs> I have 18 to... <laughs> minutes. I have 18 minutes. Wonderful. Thank you. Oh, the, I was going to say, get the next... chicken out. But Luis has the chicken. <laughs> I, will mute uh, I do, I do. I have it somewhere. I'll, I'll go get it. Um, the problem is, how are we passing the chicken? Actually, I, actually, it's not even the chicken. I have a toddler that it's going away from my from my field of view. So, ah, wonderful. He's got a chicken as well. Okay. All right, all right. So, uh, room, room number three, room number three, uh, we discussed about the conference. Uh, we had a very interesting uh, debate on the things we would like to have done better. So there was one big debate about uh, the focus of the content. Is the, um, I mean, the format, we discussed about it. Maybe it could have been spread out over more weekends to make it less intense. Uh, but I, you know, I, I didn't agree with that because it would be just like a series of webinars. So we had a little bit of discussion on that. And we kind of came to the conclusion that we cannot do it better because the tools for doing better just don't exist yet. So with the tools we have, we kind of did a good job. Uh, the kind of, an answer to the third question, it aligns with the objectives of the conference as well. Another thing that we discussed was, um, oh, got a, got a blank. Uh, another thing we discussed was the fact that the content of the conference was uh, a little bit, was maybe three quarters practical and a quarter theoretical. So we were wondering if there we, you know, in the next conference, we could not focus more on actual practical things that emerge from the field. That was a, an interesting criticism. Um, we talked about, uh, I don't have, I don't have to say this here. Uh, we said we could have done a more uh, pauses, you know, like 30 minute sessions and actually have done the equivalent of a poster session where we would, would create several channels, voice channels, where people would have a one slide and share their screen and people would drop in and discuss about their work. So that would be an equivalent of a poster session, but online, we could have done that, but we didn't. So that was something we would have done better. And um, 
And what else? In terms of objectives, I think we fulfilled our objectives. I mean, at least the, the people were kind of happy with uh, that in comparison to the objectives. Uh, and I think that's it. Perfect. Two minutes. <laughs> an, an interesting point that was missing is to add more people from the field that has a turbine and that uh, can give us feedback on uh, if they are AP or not. Okay, I write it down. Okay, uh, so I have I have written uh, your your points uh, in the general feedback. Uh, yeah, feel free to correct them if uh, it's wrong. It's just uh, under the pad. Uh, next room. All right, I could do the next one. It's okay. So you guys can hear me. Yes, perfect. Um, yeah, so I start uh, breakout room number one. So oh. generally, what we did uh, discuss about the first question, if we like the format and the structure. Uh, yeah, it was really nice, but the online stuff is hard normally. So uh, it was good to have it split at two weekends because having it in one, in one weekend and uh, starting in the morning, for example, would be like way too much. And it still was quite a lot of stuff. And so for us, it would have been great to have more breaks in between the sessions. And uh, the hackathons were a bit uh, over the top as well. So uh, I tried to attend them both and I, I did show up in the session, but I was like just me and one or two others. And uh, so I also left quite soon. And uh, the others also said it's, it's a bit too much to have hackathons going on in parallel as well. But we were quite happy how it worked, uh, especially collaborating on Discord and with the people uh, just uh, chatting uh, between uh, during the week and stuff like that. So it was, it was great to have these tools and work. And uh, so, yeah, that was the first question for us. The second question, if it was to be done again, what, we, what would you remove and add to the conference? Uh, yeah, we would add breaks between the sessions, like half an hour or something. Uh, we would remove the hackathons or do something different instead of them, some other format that uh, enables uh, collaboration or something like that. And we would uh, improve the speed dating thing that we had on the first day. That was cool the way it was, but we would also like some kind of thing where we get random people uh, to talk to and say like mm -hmm. in a fixed format, having like uh, five minutes with a, with a completely random picked person and have three fixed questions to start a conversation about like, what do you do for, for wind work? And uh, where do you come from? What's your main experience or stuff like that? So you can build a conversation on. Uh, the third question, do you think the conference goals are fulfilled? Uh, yes, as good as it gets in that kind of format is what we would say. Although it was really, it would be really cool and to meet in person because an online conference is not our preferred format, and definitely it would be would be great to show up uh, in person again and talk to each other and hang out in the evenings and have a grab something to eat and stuff like that. And uh, the other comment from Con Costas, who showed up in the room later, was just it was great. Um, yeah. So what would you like to get in? Would you like to get involved in further conferences? Yes, but it would be depending on what kind of situation each of us are facing right now in their in their personal lives, and if it's uh, if there is time available to contribute. So it's hard Thank to say right know. now. And that's it, actually. Just last question. It's hard to say right now uh, if we could uh, contribute and organize the conference next one. So that's it, basically from room number one. Thank you. Many thanks uh, for this feedback, room one. Um, who wants to go on? We kind of lost your secretary, but uh, if we if you want, we can go with the group three. Who who was the secretary? Uh, Guille Guille Peta. Okay. But I can read it and kind of okay. kind of share. So, okay, thanks. Okay. Well, uh, in the question number one, we, let me, uh, it's just a banner. 
a per, uh, I'm sorry, I'm lost. The... Okay, now I have it again. For question one, um, not fully participating to all activities, but uh, let me check it again. Sorry. Well, for the question one, uh, the main issue was uh, not all the participants uh, been able to to be all along the hackathons and the conference itself. Uh, so let me check again. Uh, so the format, I think uh, it was okay. It was very good. Uh, but maybe the structure of the of the conference itself uh, could be reshaped. So uh, it's very good. Uh, it was thought that very optimistic for the amount of people who will register. And I may I think that the main problem was uh, the way the people connected during the week because in the weekends uh, the Zoom sessions were excellent and then the amount of people who participate to the hackathons was uh, less so the the format was okay maybe we have to reshape the times the timings the question two uh, was it if, if we done it again uh, what i will change and um, what we talked was uh, just uh, that uh, it would be better to do it only in the weekends because because we are all in uh, not being uh, face to face fully, fully dedicated to the concept for the conference. Uh, we keep our life on the week and we can concentrate on the weekends to to participate on on the on the conference. So okay, thank you, Damian. Okay. Is, is there uh, rapidly another? Uh... Another point, or is it? Uh... No, no, it's uh, kind of the same for the other ropes. Okay. Thank you. I try to keep uh, the time. Uh, to manage <laughs> the time so <laughs> we, everyone can be uh, included. Um, uh, last group, maybe. Uh, Andrew, do you want to go on? Sure, thank you, Adrian. I'll try and be quick, keep us in time and um, encapsulate what we discussed. First thing to say is we all really love the conference. I think that should be made very clear. It was a great time. We really had a, a really insightful uh, time. Time management, really hard to do, but managed well, um, especially after technology. Um, it was really organized considering all of the difficulties, although some sessions hard to join. Might have been nicer with more faces um, present in some of the sessions to have that sense of community um, but obviously that can be difficult with bandwidth etc um, both webinars and meetings good webinars we could avoid disrupt disruptions um, but we also have the ability to let people talk um, meetings because we could see each other uh, so that's sort of um, the time the format and, and so on uh, if to be done again what would be removed or added uh, and conference goals being fulfilled and involvement in future we kind of wrapped into one set of answers um, so potentially remove the hackathon but that wasn't a universal position uh, they were very exhausting from an organizational perspective um, or with a different time frame although others said that uh, the hackathons are really good and perhaps if they were spaced out a little bit more uh, it would be easier generally the goals were fulfilled and participation in future was, was very uh, keenly um, held by us all um, hackathons could be maintained at least to kickstart reflections and projects, um, but perhaps if we review, review the way Discord have been used, we may have more efficient conversations, uh, and um, perhaps we should have encouraged the hackathons more. A number of you have already mentioned, shame not everyone came along, um, and uh, I, I was certainly guilty of that, but if, you know, if other people had gone along, it would have obviously uh, had more made out of it. I'm in for time, Adrian. Um, uh, maybe our, less is more. I think we've I've said all that was in there, and just yeah. to echo what everyone else said, uh, great stuff. Thank you, thank you, Andrew. That was uh, synthetic. <laughs> um, okay, wow, uh, many thanks. That was. Uh, oh, do, do we have another room or? Uh... 
I don't think so. Uh, we have four uh, four packs, so it's okay. Um, okay. Thanks for having playing the game. I hope it was uh, cool to uh, gather in small rooms like that and to to, to chat about the conference. Um, and uh, we'll try to send maybe a small uh, form about the conference uh, to all the participants because we are only 19. But it's good to have like live feedback. Um, so yeah, we we depassed a bit the, the time from 20 minutes of this session. But I think it was necessary to take the time to discuss. Um, and now I can, uh, either we can do a small break. So I propose that if you want to do a small break, you put your camera and you do that. Uh, and uh, if you want to go on uh, with the, directly with the, <laughs> the conference uh, board feedback, uh, you can uh, bring your hands down. Okay. That's democracy <laughs> in action. I think uh, we need a break. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's have, have a cup of tea. And um, I guess not to finish too late. Uh, let's not excess uh, 15 minutes uh, break. Okay. Um, we could uh, do so. Let's uh, here uh, in France. It's uh, so it's 54. It's uh, 554. I guess uh, GMT is 454. So at uh, 5.10, uh, 10 minutes past uh, 5, we could uh, come back here. And uh, I will let my, uh, my, uh, my let's, uh, let's uh, stay connected. Okay. <laughs> 